I remember Yang Zhao saying this quote in a conference I was attending and it always resonated with me. He said, reading and writing should be the floor, not the ceiling. And that always really connected with me because my focus on innovation over the past several years is really kind of looking at doing new and better things, but it's not disregarding the basics. And I'll be honest with you, it is very important for me to be explicit how important the basics are. When someone says to me, hey, we don't need times tables, we don't need spelling tests. I'm like, yeah, we, we still need those things. Those are things that I think are really important. And it's not negating our kids actually having a deep understanding, but understanding there's certain things that we need to learn and understand. If you say to me, kids don't need spelling tests because we've got spell check. My first response is, well, you gotta kind of be in the vicinity of the word. You can't just slap the keys and hope for the best. So it's not the basics or innovation, it's actually going further. It's actually having some really important skills and actually developing it so we can go further than what we could when we were kids. The same is true with research. The idea that it's either innovation or, or research, there's only one that we can actually focus on is not always true. You can look at some of the best practices that have been done over time and really kind of have an understanding of that. But if you say to me, hey, this works for 90% of students. My first question will be, well, what are you doing for that 10%? And so sometimes we can research best practices, what really works with many of our students, but it's not gonna work with all of them. That's where the innovation comes in, is how do we actually iterate? How do we take what we know and modify it based on where we're at, who we serve, and, and really thinking about those connections in our community. Talking about all this, I was reminded of this when I was talking to Frank McKay, and I'm actually speaking at a conference uh, coming up in, in June. It's called the 2024 Early College Summit, and they were talking about innovating for student success. And it's not about negating the basics, not about negating research, but really how do we get to that next level? Focusing on those things, but actually innovating to understand who we serve and how we can best help them, and honestly, ourselves. So we kind of talked about the conference, why it was such a focus, you know, for what we're doing. What's that tie between research and innovation? I'm really excited about speaking at this conference. It was great to talk to Frank. Um, you can actually see the link below if you're interested in going to this conference. I would love to see you. It's actually in, in uh, Durham, North Carolina. I know a lot of people um, from North Carolina uh, listen to this podcast. Maybe Michael Jordan. <laughs> Maybe. I doubt it. But anyways, if you know Michael Jordan in North Carolina, just let me know. I'm a big fan. Uh, but anyways... I'm so excited to speak at this conference. It was great to talk to Frank and you'll learn a lot about the notion of early college, research, and innovation, the connection to that. Great podcast episode. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed to have Frank McKay with RTI International. And he is actually, um, he brought me in to speak at the 2024 Early College Summit that is happening June 4th and June 5th, 2024. I'm looking at the site, right? I got the, I got that already. Right. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, Frank, actually, we we're talking, he has done um, so many different teaching jobs. And, uh, and now he, he's working with RTI. So before I kind of get into that, we talk about the event, um, kind of what some of the missions, some of the stuff that you're actually doing. And the, the, the theme I absolutely love um, is innovating for student success. And I'm gonna ask you what that means to you because I think that's a really important concept because I think a lot of times in education, people hear the term innovation and they just think it's, hey, we're gonna get kids to use technology and then everything will be fixed. And that's not how I think you or I see that. But like, what does innovating for student success mean to you? What does that look like? How do we make that happen? So if you can just kind of tell everyone who you are, um, what you do today, how you got there, I think it's a great place to start. Sure, absolutely. And yeah, thanks for the invitation to be on the podcast. I uh, love your work. Um, and I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about I how so. we- I hope so, because I'm coming there. So I hope you don't- That's right. <laughs> yeah, worst. we're ready. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have been working at RTI International for the last, I guess, seven, eight years. And RTI International is a big, uh, large research nonprofit. We do research and everything from healthcare to education, international development. And I, I work in um, K-12 education in the in U.S. I should say K-13 education because right. we're working with early college high schools. And with, with RTI, the mission of RTI is to turn research into practice. And we, we really focus on using social uh, social sciences and sciences to do that. 
uh, I work in the Center for Education Services, which is a unique or, uh, center at RTI, where the way I like to say it is we help schools, districts, state agencies innovate. They, hmm. they're, they're constantly working on solving really um, challenging, complex problems in education. And we bring our expertise as past teachers, principals, uh, superintendents and and the research to to help think about like think outside the box in terms of how can mm -hmm. we tackle these problems in a in a different way collaboratively as partners. Um, I can share more about my background, but that's that's where I am currently. Yeah, because I, like I know you 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 you've been in the classroom, you've taught you know literally all over the world, which I find really fascinating. The the one question I I, I thought about. Um, as soon as you talked about, you know, RTI, some of the work, and then you tie it to innovation, um, there's almost this, this kind of force pushing against each other that everything, you know, when you talk about research, a lot of people think about like totally focused on best practice. And then, and then innovation is almost somewhat people actually think it's opposite of that. And where do you kind of see the intersection of like research kind of, you know, seeing, you know, what's being done and kind of learning from that process, but innovation, that idea of like doing new and better things. So where do you see that kind of intersection of those two things? Because I think a lot, there's, there's a lot of camps out there that it's, they believe it's one or the other, that we always need to base everything on best practice. Everything has to be research-based and, and there, then there's the other side of it where it's all about doing the new stuff. And I, 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 I'm not a, a fan of that. I think there's always that middle space I think is the most powerful. So where do you kind of see that in, in the work that you're actually doing? It's a great question. And it's a great question because over the years, I love to think about innovation. And honestly, I, I've run into a lot of people who, who think innovation is either a bad word or just right. almost uh, like it's meaningless because they're like, well, what does innovation mean? And I actually love Tim Brown from IDEO. Um, he's written a number of books about, you know, human-centered design, design thinking. And so, you know, really a thought leader in innovation. And he defines innovation as a good idea, well implemented. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, that's it. Like, that's such a, such a great I, way to define it because innovation doesn't have to be new. It just has to mean you're bringing new thinking to a challenging problem or an interesting problem and you're bringing a new way of thinking about it right. and you're doing the hard work to figure out how to do it well and so i think of innovation in terms of like there's a lot of good innovation research and doing good research we know it takes takes a while to get it done to get it published but we can learn a lot from that and i also like to think about the intersection of bringing research as well as our experience because we learn a lot from experience oh. and we can bring those those factors to um, to think about innovation in, in that way of just bringing good ideas that work. Yeah, and this is actually like really, to be honest with you, this is really one of the reasons I actually do this with, you know, um, conferences, school districts that I'm speaking into. It's kind of like a meeting that we're having to kind of talk about, you know, where you're at, what's your organization about. And then for me to kind of think about like how I'm tying in, you know, some of my messaging, some of the work that I'm doing, because I, 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 I know I'm very, cognizant of this idea that it shouldn't be research innovation like one of, one of the things that always um i've always challenged is that um people think that when we talk innovation that we're saying we're foregoing the basics that kids you know don't worry about reading and writing because ai will do that for you right spell check all this other stuff and i'm like a huge advocate of times tables i'm a huge advocate of spelling tests i think those are really important and the, and the joke i always make is that you know that you know, people will say like, Hey, we got spell checks. So kids don't really need to know us. I'm like, we, you kind of gotta be in the vicinity of the word. Like you gotta be somewhat close. And so I think when you're talking about that notion of research and innovation, kind of, as you said, um, there are some times where, and I talked about this in innovators mindset, it's uh, invention. It's something totally new that we've never done before, but it has to be better than what was done prior. It can't just be new or there's iteration. And there's like, Hey, so we, we've looked at this practice. Um, and it's, we've seen that, you know, the research tells us this work, but our community is a little bit different than the ones that maybe they're kind of getting their research based on. So what are the iterations and how do we make this our own? And, you know, a lot of my work is, is really kind of focusing on not telling people what they should do, but just kind of giving them ideas. And then hopefully they understand that they actually create the solutions. And I think that that's something that, um, is really important to me. 
Um, what what is like? I know that you the the conference is the early college summit for people who are not listening. You kind of mentioned this briefly. Like, what is early college and how is it connected to K thirteen education and and what is that? You know, what opportunities does that maybe give kids that they haven't had when I was a kid in school? Absolutely, that's it's such a great question. And the first thing I'll say is that there's kind of a core idea of what early college is and what the early college model is, but there's actually a number of different ways that it's implemented. So you'll hear in some states uh, thinking about early college and they're talk really talking about an, a program that's within a larger traditional comprehensive high school um, that's providing, you know, kind of college pathways uh, that may include a fifth year of high school where the kids are taking more, students are taking more college classes in high school. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, mm -hmm. where I'm, where I'm based and RTI actually facilitates a network, we call it the Early College Network within North Carolina. And in North Carolina, early colleges are actually standalone high schools that are typically on the campus of a four-year or a two-year college partner. Mm. And the, the whole idea of an early college high school is that students are taking, they're, they're enrolling in a high school where they have a, a pathways to take college classes while in high school and typically earn an associate's degree hmm. and earn a full two years of college credit while in high school. And I, oh. as dual, there, there are a lot of dual enrollment programs now where more kids are taking, more students are taking more college classes in high school. And so a differentiator with, with early college high schools are typically that there are these pathways that lead to um, college, robust and extensive college credits and degrees and, and other certifications. I'll say one, one other thing that's pretty common to the definition of early college high schools is increasing access, especially for first generation college students and students who are typically and have been traditionally underrepresented in higher education. And so for the last 20 years, early college high schools have been really expanding that access and, and, and the research and actually some research out of RTI and the Serve Center at UNC Greensboro um, and among others has been showing that it does make a difference for right. those students. Well, it's interesting that you said, because like, I, I don't believe college is the only way to success. And I think, you know, I'm not, saying that that's the focus, but you're ensuring, but I always think that it's important that we have that door open, especially for, you know, students who might not have the ability that, you know, maybe we had, like, I remember my student loan when I came out and I'm like, I hated it so much. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like, it was so much better than some of the student loans right now. Right? Like it's really, really bad. And, um, as you know, myself, I'm, I'm a first generation, um, university college graduate, my parents had a grade six education and grade two education between, uh, my mom and dad, and they came to North America because they saw education as, you know, a way to a better life and that they didn't have the same access that they would for themselves and for their kids coming over. So I, I love kind of that mission of, you know, what you're doing. And, you know, that's something I'll be talking about quite a bit in my own experience, because I think we kind of neglect that, that, you know, many of our families um, came over to North America to kind of open those doors for us. And then, you know, sometimes we kind of take it for granted. And I know my parents are uh, really proud of, you know, the, that I that was to be able to expand education because they knew it would open doors that they didn't necessarily have. Um, one of the sessions that we're, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, and you can ask me about this too, but I know you said you wanted to mention it. And by the way, if you're like listening to this, can anyone sign up for this conference, by the way? Like you can go, yeah. right? like, is it limited to just North Carolina or is it anybody? No, that's a great question. Um, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot more interest as early college programs have been expanding to those right. states. There's been more funding. So a lot of people are saying, well, he's been doing this longer than, than our, the folks in our backyard. And since North Carolina was one of the early, early adopters right. of early colleges, we've got over 134, about 134 early colleges in North Carolina. So yes, it's open. Uh, we're getting more interest. And Good. so last year, I think we had nine or 10 different states represented at the summit. So um, definitely open to folks from other states. Um, and, you know, I, I know you'll have this time stamped, but uh, yeah. registration is open until May 3rd. Uh, so reach out if you're interested and have questions. I'll also say that in the next question is typically who should come. And we, it it's, tends to be a practitioner's summit. So we get lots of principals and teachers, 
but we also do a lot of, because student supports are a really important part of early colleges and the early college implementation, we get a lot of school counselors and then other, other staff who are kind of in a role that in North Carolina we call the college liaison, mm -hmm. who's the staff member who really serves as a bridge between the high school and the college right. partner. In other states, there are other people in the, that, that role has different titles, but we get a lot of interest from those folks as well as district administrators. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say this because I was actually, um, we're recording this on April 23rd. I was just in Comac, uh, New York, uh, in Long Island. And they're not, they're not like, I, they're not like an early college uh, district. But that being said, they're, they're bringing in college level courses. And you're seeing, you know, people are seeing the impact of that giving kids opportunities. Because I, I think part of it too, is that that opportunity starts to kind of get kids to, you know, kind of, kind of figure out what they want to do. Whereas I find traditional high school, maybe confuse kids more than anything, right? Like you're, you're not really able to explore things that maybe you, you want to, you're excited about because you just got to tick the boxes to get your graduation requirements. So I'm seeing more and more, um, schools and I, I'm going to actually link to below to the, 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 the podcast I did with, uh, the superintendent there, Jordan, who's absolutely amazing, who was talking about that because there's a lot of, um, you know, synergy between what you're sharing, what, what, what he was sharing. So, um, yeah. one of the sessions I'm talking about there is the idea of like moving from digital citizenship to digital leadership. And I think this is really, um, something I'm very passionate about. I've been talking about it, um, for years. So tell me a little bit about, you know, your thoughts and, you know, kind of what your hopes are for that session and, and, and what you're hoping to achieve with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're, we're excited about the, the keynote you're going to share. And we're also excited that you're going to be able to do a, a breakout session for us. And when uh, when I was when we were kind of talking about what those options were, um, that one stood out to me because we talk about digital literacy so much, which right. is so important. But this idea of shifting, helping students shift from just thinking about, oh, what's digital literacy? How do I engage responsibly right. to really thinking about, oh, what's digital leadership? Like, how do I use these tools to actually um, think about how I can be a digital leader and, and mm -hmm. use, the, use the tools at, at, in front of, you know, that, that are continuing to evolve and emerge. Um, so, yeah, we're excited to, to have that offered at the summit. You know, you know, so as you're talking about this, the one of the things I've really tried to train my mind to think about is, you know, even talking about in education, and it's really important is literacy, right? Like literacy, and you know, kind of we're thinking about that from the concept of reading and writing, even though we know there's much more to literacy than than reading and writing. Um, but we kind of stop there, right? Like that's a focus. And so one of the things that I always talk about is like kind of moving from literacy to fluency and what, what the difference is. So, you know, even um, kind of thinking about when I took French, you know, in, you know, a high school in Canada, there, there's a certain element of like, we did what we had to do to get our grades, but we never really focused on the notion of fluency and what would it, what would that have looked like and how do you get people to that point? And so when you're talking about that, that move from digital citizenship to digital leadership, I feel we spent a lot of time telling our kids, um, you know, just kind of how to exist online, you know, don't share your passwords, little simple things like that, which I think is important, obviously, but it's actually, how are we going to that next level where they're like, Hey, here's like an opportunity to kind of leverage some of these tools to, you know, create opportunities. I know from personal experience, I have become way smarter over the years because I've learned to connect with people like yourself, um, you know, through podcasts. Uh, through my blog, people commenting, like a lot of my work that I, you know, a lot of stuff I've written about um, is changed thinking because of people commenting on blogs saying, Hey, have you thought about this? I'm like, I, I actually didn't. So I'm glad that you said something. Cause now, you know, I'm going to kind of re shift kind of how I think. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have the opportunities I have in the world today. Um, if I didn't start using this in meaningful ways. And I, I, and I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this because there's a struggle um, and I have this struggle too, um, that, you know, people don't want kids on phones, they don't want devices and all this other stuff. And I get it. And there is one superintendent I was listening to, and it was, it was really fascinating. They said, you know, we got rid of mobile devices in our, in our school and there's no, no cyberbullying anymore 
in our school. I'm like, yeah, okay, there's no cyberbullying during school hours. <laughs> it's very different than there's no cyberbullying because if you don't teach kids how to use this stuff, and I think that that's something I always struggle with because I don't know if all the adults really, you know, leverage this or think about it in a positive way. Um, because I'm sure there's going to be some pushback to, you know, some of those ideas like, well, kids shouldn't be using these devices and stuff like that. I'm like, if you don't teach them, then when they do have access, that's when they're going to make mistakes. Cause you know, they're kids. Give me a phone. Um, when I was 15 years old and, you know, wish for the best and that's not happening. Right. If you didn't give me any guidance. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Because I know there's going to be some challenge to that. And I think it's good because we got to kind of find that space of, you know, we want kids to be it's super easy to get distracted. Um, those are all issues, but if you don't teach our kids, then what, then what happens when they have access? Uh, yeah, I, it's a great question. And I, you know, technology is going to continue to evolve mm -hmm. and in new and different ways. And so it's, it's that kind of like you think about innovation, like what's, what's, what are the timeless skills that we need to teach? And to me, it really comes back to, you know, the fundamentals of, of, teaching kids about good re relationships, modeling good relationships. And I think about it in terms of what we saw when COVID hit. Uh, I don't know about you, but what what we saw and what I saw in, in the schools that we were working with are the schools that had built strong relationships between teachers and students and right. had done a lot of collaboration in the classroom between students. So they were kind of, I call it the three dimensions of relationships, adult, student, adult, adult, and student to students. Hmm. Schools that had built the, that culture didn't, I mean, it, it wasn't that, there was, there was a rough transition to, to, right. to blend it in online learning, but they did it well and they had those relationships. So moving into the digital world um, full time uh, worked because they had, they had taught and cultivated that culture. And so I think now that we're, you know, where we are, that there's this kind of to take some lessons learned from that. So okay. we, if we teach kids those, those fundamental skills of, of, um, you know, relationship building and critical thinking and awareness, you know, all those things that translate, um, those are the fundamentals that they'll take both in face-to-face -face relationships as well as online. Well, it's funny because, you know, I I'm sure someone's thinking like, oh, you know, that wasn't, you know, no, it wasn't easy. And I'm like, I, you know, it definitely wasn't easy, but if you didn't have those relationships, it was impossible. I think that right. that's a really important aspect. It it's funny because Katie Martin and I are working on something, um, talking about like, artificial intelligence and we say emerging technologies and we talk about what are the timeless principles. So for example, curiosity, curiosity mm -hmm. will always serve you well. Um, you know, focusing on attaining knowledge to develop wisdom, because I think in schools, there's a lot of like, Hey, we want kids to, you know, understand these or to memorize these facts, memorize these things, but there's a difference between like memorization and deep understanding. And so are we actually focusing on kids? and our students and ourselves to actually get that. And whether it's AI, whatever technologies are coming your way, those are really important skills and something that we have to continuously develop. And as long as you kind of focus that, whatever comes your way, I think you'll, 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 you'll be fine. So um, la last, last thing I'll ask you um, as you go, um, you know, the registration's still open and, you know, I'm, I feel really blessed to come here because a lot of the thinking that's happening, you know, with RTI, with the summit, um, what, what do you think would be, uh, like, how would this be like a successful event to you when, and, you know, I, I feel some onus on this because, you know, I'm going to be there um, speaking. So like, if, if this like, you know, that we, we knocked out of the park, what does that look like to you? I, so my, my broader role at RTI is the, the leader, director of our peer learning networks. And so the early college network is, is one of the, those networks that we facilitate. And when I think about big convenings like this, a lot mm -hmm. of times it's a lot of inspiration, but maybe it falls short on a couple other things. And right. I, I like to think about kind of a three, three pronged um, kind of successful big convening where people come away really empowered to make a difference. And it's inspiration, education and celebration. So I really hope that we come away feeling inspired by your words. Yeah. I hope we come away educated, having learned something from you. And also that we've created space, really created space for everyone to learn from each other. And then just to celebrate. I mean, people are doing, and, and these educators are doing such hard work right now, such oh. important work. And so to be able to celebrate that, at, you know, this comes at the end of the typical school year. So it's a moment to step out and say, you know what, um, we've, we've 
made it to another year. We've graduated right. another round of students and it's, it's just a, a moment to celebrate. So, yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's something that I, I, that's my focus every time. So I'm like, really excited. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. that's what I try to do. Um, because the idea of, we want people to be challenged. We, you know, kind of talking about education so that they grow, but also feel affirmed. Right. And, um, Dwight Carter and I always talk about this. We talk about this notion of, uh, finding the balance of a, a warm bath and a cold shower, right? The warm mm -hmm. breath, you feel really good. You know, like you feel appreciated. The cold shower is like, oh, we, we got to pick it up a little bit. And sometimes if you have too much of one or the other, it doesn't really kind of help long term. So I love it. I'm really uh, excited to, to join you all. I'm going to like maybe snip that last part out just so I make sure that I have this as a reminder. But um, everyone, if you're listening, you can actually see uh, where to uh, sign up. I, I would love to see you there. I know Frank would love to see you there. Uh, I know tons of people in North Carolina listen to this podcast. So um, it will be a short, uh, short, you know, drive for you it, based on North Carolina standards is what a short drive is, but um, it is obviously open to anybody. So Frank's thanks so much for being on the podcast. And uh, I look forward to seeing you real soon in person. Yeah, we're looking forward to a great event. We're also right by uh, RDU Airport, so it's easy to fly into as well, okay. So, uh, which is good for you too, George. We'll I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Frank.